Good evening, Calvary Chapel. Welcome to our Wednesday night service. And the few of you that are here tonight, social distancing, masks on, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. We did have a, um, we're going to have a contest when we get done here, who has the coolest mask. Um, I think we already have a winner. I think she was the first one to walk through the door tonight. I'm not going to take a picture of her and show it to you right now. But um, anyways, if you come to church on Sunday, we will have another one. We have a gift card. Uh, for whoever's got the coolest mask. And so, uh, anyways, let's just pray and get, get started with worship. Lord, we just thank you that you are so faithful, Lord. We're, we, we're just thankful, Lord God, that even though there's a pandemic going on, we're so thankful, Lord God, for those that you are healing and those that you've healed, and those that you are touching, Lord. We pray for those families who've lost loved ones, not just because of the virus, but because of all the other reasons people die. The, the, the six or seven that I've known this past few, few months that have passed away, their families, Lord. We pray for them. But Lord, that's why coming to you and being part of who you are is so great because we know that this is not all there is. And in that, though we mourn, and though we mourn the loss of our loved ones, Lord, we understand that this ain't all there is. And because of that, we rejoice and are so thankful for the resurrection. And Father, we just thank you that you are touching lives, that you're doing a great work in this world. We sense it in the midst of all the craziness, and we're so thankful for that. And Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name to bless the service. Amen. You can stand if you like, or you can sit, if you feel comfortable. We're, we're going to keep it uh, in the intimate worship mode tonight as we were going through some songs and uh, you know there are and no matter what your walk with the Lord is uh, it's, uh, things have come unwound in this world and if you let it it can cause a little stress and I tell you it's nothing better than the power of his presence because when we um, when we enter into his presence with worship that's when we get the peace that passes all understanding that our God's in control. Even though we're not in control, this world's not in control, but our God is. Dry, but you 
are our supply. Like a rushing wind, Holy Spirit, Lord, come rushing in. Holy Spirit, Lord, rushing in. Blow like a rushing wind. Blow. One thing I've mentioned before in the past that I like to do is uh, look at the stars and gaze at the stars. And tell you what, when you're nervous about anything, when you start uh, just looking and to see how big and vast our universe is, and how big God is, and how little we are, and how insignificant, how just insignificant we can be, all of the things that are going on um, seem to get small. And I start getting a comfort knowing that this God knows me and he loves me. I find comfort in knowing that all of this going on in the world doesn't take him by surprise. I find comfort knowing that he's got an agenda right in the middle of all of it. He wants me and you to be involved. And uh, we don't know. We could be in the greatest time of all in the end and you know he's not coming back for a scared bride that's hiding out in the woods with Vienna sausages and he's coming for a glorious bride that's going to be powerful and he's going to anoint us when the time is ready as we seek him I find peace just knowing our God is in control and he's big and he knows me and he loves me he knows the well I can't say Everybody knows the, the hairs on my head because that's, that's zero, but he knows the hairs, the number of hairs on everybody's head. And Lord, it was you who created the heaven. And Lord, it was your stars in their place and Lord it is your voice that commands the morning even ocean
I think that's a great song because I was just thinking while I was studying for this particular message tonight because it's an interesting, interesting, interesting story and uh, picture that God wants us to see, hear, and grasp and um, thinking about how big he is and just uh, the whole world is in fear right now. The whole world is Basically, just about on, under lockdown. There's a couple of cooler countries out there, I guess, that are taking some risks and doing what they're doing. But on the most part, the whole world is losing its marbles over this, which um, it's interesting because we're going to see of a different kind of virus break out in Second in First Samuel chapter 5 or chapter 6 when we get there. And you'll be very glad it's the coronavirus that's coming through the world and not what hit the Philistines during their, um, the time that God set a plague on them. So I just think it's interesting. How many, let me just, you don't have to raise your hands, but even out there watching us, I mean, how many of you feel like um, the church is kind of coming under attack and you can just feel that the church, the church itself 
in, in its ability or in how it does itself or how it portrays itself, how it operates. It just seems like it's under attack, you know, because of a virus, which I'm not saying a virus is not real. I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is, is it's, we've just never seen this before. It's unprecedented. Now, I did go back and read the history of other pandemics around the world. Uh, uh, I think there was one that came through Mexico that um, I think there were 11 million Mexicans and there was only a million left after this particular virus wiped out um, uh, smallpox or something like that, wiped them out. And, um, you know, that's, sh- that's, that's sad and shameful that, um, that a virus, an unseen virus, can do that to, to human beings. But at the same time, we can see through the scriptures that God has used those things. He's used these things for different reasons. And he's called it wrath or judgment. And he's used it on his own people. We know that. We've studied, you know, we're in the Old Testament. And we're seeing that. So tonight we are in 1 Samuel chapter 5. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. I'm going to read a little bit of chapter 4 and get into chapter 5. But um, the children of Israel at this time, you got to remember, it's like America. And the reason I say that is because everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. Everybody does church the way they think they should do church. Everybody does religion the way they feel like they do religion. They don't feel like they have to go to church every week. They don't feel like they have to get baptized. They don't feel like they have to believe the whole Bible. They don't feel like they have to, you know, be around Christian people or go to church. And so there's all kind of ways that that we do Christianity. And I think we have to be careful because at the same time, It says everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So the children of Israel at this time are doing life their own way. And what's happening is the culture next door to them, which is the Philistine culture, disagrees with the Jewish culture. The Jewish culture disagrees with the Philistine culture. And there's clashes between the two cultures. And there's a war between the two cultures. And so there's this war that's just been going on. And Israel just lost a war. We just saw in chapter 4 where they, they lost several thousand men to this battle. And not only that, but they thought they could bring the Ark of the Covenant into the battle. I mean, we, many of us remember young enough Raiders of the Lost Ark. Um, where they were looking for the, the ark. Now, that's not a, necessarily a true story, other than the fact that the Germans did like to try to find supernatural, uh, paranormal ways of doing warfare. They did do that, but I don't think they actually looked for the, 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 the ark. But it's interesting that they wanted the ark because they thought if they had the ark, that would give them power in warfare. Well, that in itself is an Is- Israelite <laughs> false ideal. They thought that if they just took the ark, God, was, God was, um, was forced to do his will because that ark was there. and So he had to obey them and kill the enemies, their enemies, and that's not how it worked. Matter of fact, their enemies killed them and took the ark. And then we saw last week where Eli, when he heard the news that not only his two sons were dead, but it wasn't until he heard the ark was taken that he fell over and died, broke his neck, it said. He was more concerned about the ark because he was responsible for that ark. For 40 years, he was the priest in Israel. It was his responsibility to protect that ark of the the Lord and not only protect the ark, but the sanctity of the sanctuary was his responsibility and he dropped the ball by allowing his sons to commit sexual immorality at the temple and rob the people from the temple, which there's churches that have done that. We know that there's churches, pastors that have done that in the past. So that's not a new thing either. Um, and so now they're wailing and they're, they're sad that the ark is gone and, and that, that the presence of God, the glory is gone. And then we saw, we're going to read right here at the very end just to kind of get this idea in, in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 19. The daughter-in-law of Eli is having a baby right when they hear the news that her husband's dead. The ark has been captured. And uh, Eli is now dead, her father-in-law. Now his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, due to be delivered. And when she heard the news that the ark of God was captured, 
And that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and gave birth, for her labor pains came upon her. And about that time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Do not fear, for you have born a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Let me just tell you this. God's glory is, is, is throughout the whole world. He reveals it or he conceals it. You either recognize it's there or you don't recognize it's there or you're not feeling the presence of it there because you can tell. But here's the deal is we're going to watch what God does with that ark. He don't need man's help at all. He doesn't need us to watch over the ark. He doesn't need us to, to protect his glory. He doesn't need us to be the messengers of the world. He allows us to. He allows us these privileges. He allows us the privilege to be a representative, to, to be a proclaimer. He allows us that privilege. So it says the, the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. So now we're going to watch what happens to the ark. And, and, and what we see happens to the ark is going to be interesting because we're going to watch that God, like I said, does not need us. But on another level, I'm thinking of the same thing. I, I'm feeling like the Lord is allowing the church to be disrupted. He has to be. He has to be behind it. He has to be. It's his church. He's responsible for it. Now, we're also responsible for it. Like, he's the owner and we're the managers, right? And we're, we're called to manage. And so I believe that God has called us to, to, to manage his church. And so here's, here's what I want us to understand is that the way a church should work should be like a community. We live together. We take care of each other. We watch out for each other. There's not necessarily just one person that's the boss of everybody, but it's a collaborative it's a collaborative group effort. All the men should know that we adhere to the scriptures. And all the men in the family should know where we stand. All the women in the family should know where they stand. And because we know what the scriptures teach us. And if we all can do a good inductive Bible study together, which means we ask all the questions we should be asking as we're just... Because when you listen to somebody like David Caress teach, he never allowed questions. He just kept spewing and spewing and spewing so fast that nobody ever had a chance to call him out on some of the things he was saying, some ridiculous things he said. You go back and listen to him. He, he's ridiculous. But if we're together and you're doing your part, you won't let me teach something that's not biblical. You won't. You'll check me on it. That's good. We need that check and balances when it comes to the scriptures. And so... I think the Lord has, like a, like a, like a prophet or, or like Samuel. Samuel was a prophet, but he didn't tell the people necessarily what he wanted to tell them. He told them what the Lord told him to tell them. And that's where sometimes the, the guy that hears that message can get in the way. That's why God left us this so that we could check them all. Any man that wants to show up and say, we can check any man in what he says. And so that's very, very important. And so the, 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 the ark is taken. So it says, Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. When the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought it into the house of Dagon, and they set it by Dagon. Now imagine this. This is the Philistines. They're, 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 these are selfish, ruthless people who love glory. And so you can imagine the parade they probably had bringing the ark to the temple of Dagon. Pomp and circumstance had all the kings, had all the wealthy people, all the powerful people marching with the army of the Philistines, bringing the prized treasure of the Ark of the Covenant because they all knew the history of the Ark of the Covenant. Every nation around them knew the history even all the way 400 years before how they became a nation out of Egypt. Now they only heard the stories they're not seeing the evidence, by the way, the children of Israel are living because the children of Israel are living more like a Philistine than an Israelite, just like some, a lot of us Christians are living more like the world than we do as Christians. That's why I think that what we're seeing in this world 
It's a part of something like we're seeing here. Notice the celebrations in our country over changing history, over attacking history. Now, let me tell you this, though. Remember, when our country was first founded, we were under British rule. And then we decided we were no longer wanted to be under British rule, and we rebelled against Britain, and we became America. We, we broke off, and we, we realized with no representation in Britain, we didn't want to be a part and pay taxes. And so there was some reasons why we did it, but still, it was a group of people that no longer wanted to be a part of that and change things. And so we're seeing that happening here. We're seeing there's a move to change everything that we are. You, if you don't pay attention to politics or you, you think that politics is something you don't want to be involved in, you're ignorant going forward because politics are controlling your life. And if you don't pay attention, you're not paying attention to the Lord either because he's using what's going on in the world and the politics of this world as part of opening our eyes. Opening up our hearts. We have to pay attention. We have to see what they're doing. Listen, what's going on around us isn't just some mad 20-year-olds. What's going on around us isn't just a group or race of people that are just angry about one thing. There's a, there is a movement to change everything about who we are. And if we are not careful, we stay doing life and Christianity our own way, doing things what seems right to us, we're going to get led astray. I think we're under some judgment. Now, when I say that, I'm going to back it up with Scripture, then you go home and I'm going to give you some Scripture, then you decide what I'm saying is correct or not. Because God is shaking the church up. It ain't fun to come to church right now. Is it fun to sit apart from everybody? Is it fun not to come in and be able to hug and congregate and love them? No, it's not fun. Church is not fun. Our kids can't even meet. We, we can't even do children's church. We, we, we're missing the kids running around. We used to get irritated with them sometimes, but we're missing them. We're missing them. This isn't fun to do church like this. There's nothing fun about looking at all the people wearing masks here. There's, no, there's nothing fun about that. There's nothing fun about going to the store and not being able to see faces and just see eyes just looking and nobody can't see smiles anymore. Nobody's smiling. It's psychological. It's just, it's just crazy. But here's the deal. It's time for the church to figure out who she is. But we have to understand who God is to, because we've forgotten, I think. I think we can forget who he is. We think he's the God that blesses us with good stuff, nice stuff, more stuff, this stuff, that stuff, all the stuff. Because we're American Christians and we're just used to it. Our rights will be taken away from us. Some of our stuff will be taken away from us. Some of our, and when, when your rights begin to be taken away from you, then you're going to get, get real nervous. Because right now, our rights are slowly being taken from us because they're able to use this as a weapon <laughs> to put more and more policies in and controlling things in and just power to just control and move and our, our movement, our ability to even spend money. And there's so many things going on. But I want you to know God is still in control. He is still in control and he is not done with us. He is not done with the church. He's working on us. He's getting us ready. The world is doing what it wants to do. It's toppling statues. It's burning stuff down. And, and I pray for those whose lives are being at risk, whose neighborhoods, whose businesses, e even businesses right now are being closed, certain restaurants and bars. And I'm not really a bar guy, but I feel sorry for the people that own the bars and work in the bars anyways because they're still my brothers and my family. And it's just hard watching them go down. It's hard watching them not make any money and just having to close all these businesses down. But we think because all this is being taken from us that the glory has departed. The glory has not departed at all. Just because we've lost a lot of our freedoms and we're not able to do church the way we'd really like to do church. I'd like to run and just jump in your arms. But can't do that. So look, so they bring the ark the enemy 
is celebrating its victory. And I think right now there's an enemy celebrating the victory because we're like this. And they can tell, they can hear the church people are, are on this side and that side and here and there. And there, there's just all this, nobody's sure. And, and, and the devil's just sitting back, it's going right according to plan. But let's, let's listen for the voice of the Lord during all this and watch what he's going to teach us. It says when the people of they, they put they put Dagon now this is the this is Dagon half fish half man merman this is the god they worshipped half man half fish standing up in the in the temple and they bring the ark which is the the ark the ark is only like I think three foot by two and a half foot. I mean it's it's a real small thing it's not very big at all but it has a cherubim on it I mean it's spectacular even though it's very small. But it's very small in comparison probably to the statue of Dagon in their temple. And it said, when the people of Ashdod arose early in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on its face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. The Lord says a rock carved by man's hands cannot stand before him as anything. Look, God is not in that ark. That ark speaks of who God is. That God speaks of inside that ark is the, is the manna, is the, the, the rod that budded, Moses' rod that budded, and the Ten Commandments inside that ark that represent our. There's a story just in those three things about who the Lord is. He's our shepherd with the staff. He's our provider with the manna. And he's our God with the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's, it's perfect. Three things in that ark. So here's Dagon, fallen. And when the people of Ashtar, they, there it was fallen its face to the earth before the ark. The Lord said so they took Dagon and set it in its place against. They stood it back up. And when they arose early the next morning, there was Dagon, fallen on its face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, the head of Dagon, and both the palms of its hands were broken off on the threshold. Only Dagon's torso was left of it. So the statue not only fell this time, but it broke. Its head came off and its hands came off. And you know what the Lord was telling him? That your God is worthless and useless. At that moment, they should have recognized who the Lord Jesus Christ was or who Yahweh was. And they should have and they should have cried out to him to see such a miracle like that. But instead, what they did is they made up a superstition. And look at the superstition. Therefore, neither the priest of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. Have you ever done the don't step on a crack, break your mother's back? Basically, that's what they're saying. Don't step on that threshold or you'll bring a curse on yourself. That's what they came up with. That's what they saw. Let me tell you something. Some of us have seen lesser things that brought us to the Lord. Thank God. We recognize something in our lives was the hand of the Lord, whether it was a spanking or whether it was a lift up. We recognize the Lord and we've come to him. It says, therefore, the priests of Dagon nor any who come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon to Ashdod to this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how it was, they said, The ark of God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is harsh toward us and Dagon our God. Therefore they sent and gathered themselves all the lords of the Philistines, and they said, What shall we do with the ark of God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried away to Gath. Let's take it to the next city. So they carried the ark of God of Israel away, and so it was after they carried it away that the hand of the Lord was against the city with, the, with great destruction, and he struck the men of the city, both small and great, with tumors, and broke out on them. Therefore they sent the ark of God to Ekron, so it was that the ark of God came to Ekron, and the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought the ark of God of Israel to us to kill us and our people. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God in Israel and let it go 
back to its own place so it does not kill us and our people for there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city and the hand of God was very heavy there and the men who did not die were stricken with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Now, if you have a King James Version, that word for tumors is different. And the Old Testament definition of that word is a sore, is like hemorrhoids, which would be a bleeding ulcer on your anus. Now, that's the old scholars believe that. Can you imagine? Instead of just getting a chest cold or sick, pneumonia, that you had something else going on. How humbling that would be. To have this problem going on right here. Now, newer scholars say that it possibly is the bubonic plague that they're referring to. Because the bubonic plague was brought in by mice or rats. They knew that. And when they send this ark off here pretty soon, they're going to send it with some golden rats. And golden tumors. Whatever that looked like. But isn't it interesting that God would use an illness to the body to get their attention? sickness, a virus to get their attention. Now, thankfully, our virus here is less than 1%, 2% death rate. Overall, that's not a bad number for what, and that's why I think it's judgment because in, let me just read to you this in um, In 1 Peter chapter 4, there's a verse that says, Peter writes to us, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter says this, Beloved, he's talking to the church, he's talking to Christians, so he's talking to us that are believers. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial. That word fiery trial is more like a purifying fire. It's not a punishment fire. It's a purifying fire. There's a difference. There's, there's a fire that destroys, and there's the fire that purifies. This, 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 what, this fiery trial is, what you, is a word you use to purify gold, silver, metals. So listen to what he says. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the purification process. Trial. But he calls it a trial. You know why he calls it a trial? Because you're not going to like it. It's going to be tough. It's going to be stressful. It's going to have some anxiety to it. It's going to cause anxiety. It's going to cause maybe some fear to a degree. But God will use that and he will bring it to a place, I believe, where it will be used more as a purification than a destro destroyer. Because he says, beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Some of the sufferings of Christ were not all physical. Not all of his sufferings were because he was beaten. Some of his sufferings were because he was rejected. Some of his sufferings was because people turned on him. Some of his sufferings was because he was rejected. Those are the kind of sufferings. He was rejected. Those were the hardest. He would have taken the, the marks on the back at any time. It was the rejection of his people, the people he loved and died for, that he came for, that he created, his own creation. His own creation. And they rejected him. That's painful. Because even, even, even in this trial, there's, there's been tension, there's been, there's been anxieties, there's been, you know, confusion, and there's been just a, a lot of different emotions going through here. And, and let me tell you something, for anybody and all of you that, that filled out the form and even gave a comment, all of them were great. There were so many different comments, and I just, I appreciated, there was a couple of them that stood out, and a couple of them, were, the, the concerns were what it was doing to the church. And that's what I appreciate, that one. 
I also appreciate the ones who thought, you know, we need to wear the mask more. We need to make sure we're separating more, not hugging more. And so, we, so we're making these adjustments. We're doing what we need to do so that we can at least come together. And some of us lift our hands when we worship. Because when you're at home, it's really hard to do that. When you sit at the table in your pajamas with a cup of coffee right there, it's hard to just get up and go like this in your living room. You kind of feel weird to do it. But when you're in church and you're around other people, you do it. And so I think there's something to us meeting together. Just, I'm motivated, other than the few people that are getting sleepy, wondering why you came. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just, what I'm going to say is this, is, is I want to be in your presence. I want to be around you. But I, I think he's judging us to, us to the degree to force us to see what's important in our lives. What's the most important thing? Because listen, I'm not finished reading this. If you are reproached for the name of Christ. Now, that, now in, in, in I think in these days that we're living in, we're, we're going to have two different trials. We're going to have the trial of, of uh, the virus on how to handle the virus and try to you know, maneuver all that, that road. But then we have this, ho- this whole social movement that's going on. And it, Like I'm on Twitter. I go read Twitter. It's a scary world out there. There's people getting jumped and beat up just for being a particular race and a different color. And, 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 and it's just it's, it's going nuts out there. It's going crazy. Let me tell you something. They're coming for the, all this. Remember, Satan is what's behind all this. And if Satan is behind all this, his ultimate goal is to get here to the church. So we're going to have two attacks coming at us. We're going to have this virus that's trying to keep us apart. And then we're going to have this social attack that's coming at us. And we will be reproached for being Christians. We've been being reproached for years. There has been a revival in the last three years. We, because the, the eight years before the last three years, we started seeing you know, certain policies weakening the church, certain policies coming after the church and coming after you know, our religious freedoms. And then the last three years, we, we've seen a wall go up and we've seen a kind of protection towards the church the last three years. But in the last six months or the last few months especially, we've seen some crazy things going on and we see that our world is not turning back to what it was. There's no way this next generation is going to be okay with that. This next generation is furious, and they don't even know why, really. They think they do, but they don't. Because just like I asked my daughter, not not a shot to my daughter at all, but I asked her, she's 20, I said, hey, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, do you know what the political spectrum was? you know what people were debating? Do you know what was going on politically back in those? Mm Mm-mm. I said, baby, if you'd watch it, you could see that this is, this is where we were headed, the way it was going. And uh, it's not all to blame, the where we want to put the blame at, if you really look at how the, it's, it's our system that's, that doesn't work. The democracy, Christians can't survive in a democracy forever because a democracy always is going to go to the majority. And this isn't about majority rule. It's been... It's always been about majority rule, but majority rule doesn't always lead correctly. We've seen that in the book of Exodus when, the, when Moses went up to the mountain and he was gone 40 days. Next thing you know, a couple of them rose up and led thousands of them into sin, just like that. It's coming. I'm not finished. But let... None of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or even as a busybody in other people's matters. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. For the time has come. You know, it's funny that he says this in the first generation of Christianity. This has to be implying all the way to us because there's no way Christianity had gotten that far off that it needed to be purified that quickly. Maybe it did. Maybe it was because I guess, you know, they were trying to bring in circumcision and all that kind of stuff into the church. But listen, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, 
what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? So he is saying that the church of Jesus Christ, his church, he's going to first start there with the purification process. The purification is going to start with us. So if we're living in the last days, if this is part of the last days thing that God's doing to move towards revealing the Antichrist to us or however that's going to work or the rapture comes, whatever, if we think that all this is connected to the last days setting up of the Antichrist, then what's going on has to be for us first because we're still here. We're still here, so it has to start with us. Before God can tr- just justly go and bring his wrath of judgment, which is different, when he brings his wrath of judgment, then we'll be gone. But right now, he is working on us. He is, he is, he is, he is trying to defragment us from the world. He is trying because we've been in the world so much and being so intertwined with it that I would get up here myself and go, go Cowboys. I mean, I'm part of the world. I mean, I like the Dallas Cowboys, but I told Bob Chase the other day, I go, you know, the time is coming probably that I won't want to talk football with you no more, that I won't even say go Cowboys because they'll go so far in the other direction that I cannot stand where they're standing. I'm willing to lose whatever I have to lose to get to where I want to go. And where I want to go is with the Lord Jesus Christ, man. That's where I want to go. He says, if the righteous one is scarcely saved. Because <laughs> I know it, sometimes it seems like we're saved by the skin of our teeth, man. What will, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? If it's hard for us just to be the church. That's a good thing because God, not that you have to be in my presence to be a part of the church because that's not how it works, but there is is in us things that we have to get out of us. We're so Christianized that we have Christian theme parks. We had them. Remember Heritage USA? Bakers had Heritage USA. They had they had roller coasters. They had play stuff there. It was a Christian theme park. You could be a member. And now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. And through us, listen to this, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. The way we talk to people, the way we share our faith should just... Draw people with the sweet fragrance of that love. For we are, the, we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Check this out. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death. And to the other the aroma of life leading to life. When people hear our voice and hear our message, they're angry with it. They can't stand Jesus Christ and that name. When you watch movies, you'll see that in some of those movies... Or you'll hear, you've heard in some of those movies, they always say, Jesus Christ. And they're not praying when they say it. Let me get to one last scripture. You know what? Read, turn to one Psalm 106 with me. I wanted to read this Psalm. Psalm 106. I, I want to read the whole Psalm. And then I'm going to show you one more scripture and then we'll be gone. Psalm 106. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. Who can utter the mighty acts of the Lord? Who can declare all his praise? Blessed are those who keep justice and he who does righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, with the favor you have toward your people. O visit me with your salvation that I might see the benefit of your chosen ones, that I might rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. We have sinned with our fathers. We have committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Notice what he's saying. He's saying, we forgot how great you were like our fathers did. And I'm concerned that we'll forget as Christians how great Jesus Christ is and rather love the things of the world more than the things of the Lord. Nevertheless, 
He saved them for his name's sake that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also and dried it up. So he led them through the depths and through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praises. They soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness into their soul. I just, I just want us to remember not to forget whose we are. During this time of no sports, during this time of no entertainment, during this time of, of not being able to get out and go anywhere, you got to dig into your spirit and your soul and make sure you're ready because, listen, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's not going to get better. We, told, we were told perilous times. In the last days, not glorious, not wonderful. We've had enough wonderful and glorious days in the past. These are interesting days, my friend, interesting days indeed. And I would encourage you to dig in. And if, and if you know he's there, ask him to reveal to you what's going on on the inside. I want to read this last scripture to you. And you who have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Now remember, he uses the world to do that. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness, now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. It's okay not to be happy right now because it's tough right now. <laughs> now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Notice, trained through this discipline like warriors, like soldiers. We're being trained for something. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body. Now, I put this up. I forgot that I put this up. But I put this up because it says something in here about our time with communion that we may need to reconsider and think. But let, man ex but let a man examine himself. I love that the Lord says you get to be your own judge. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. He judges us. So he doesn't have to condemn us. He rebukes us because he loves us. He chastens us because he's training us. He's training us. This is training ground. This is teaching us how to be the church correctly. This is the church that Jesus Christ started way back almost 2,000 years ago. And here we get to be alive during these wonderful days, exciting times, Scary and anxious at the same time, but should be very exciting times for us because we could possibly see the return of the Lord, and that will be spectacular. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. And, Father, we ask you to just continue to reveal your plan for us. Father, we pray for this virus to just disappear, to go away, to be done with, Lord. We pray for those in our family to be safe. And, Father, we ask you to... Uh, continue to give us wisdom as we go forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Hold on before you leave.